Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's SRI seminar with Professor Beth Novak for a talk entitled Unlocking Collective Intelligence, AI's Role in Enhancing Democracy. Uh, my name is Avery Slater. I'm assistant professor with the Department of English here at the University of Toronto, and I'm faculty fellow with the schwartz riesman Institute for Technology and Society. Uh, before we begin today, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of Credit River. Today, this land is still home to many Indigenous people working to reclaim their rights to self-determination. We're grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. Although we're joining today from different places, we invite you to take a moment to reflect on the history and relations of the land you're on. So for some logistics as we begin, uh, as with many of these sessions, uh, this session today is being recorded. Uh, Professor Novak will speak for around 50 minutes. Uh, we will take questions after the talk and during the Q&A portion, of the seminar, we encourage all participants to uh, ask questions if you have them. At that time, we'll have you use the raise hand function in Zoom. Uh, and at the time that we see your question, we will unmute your mic and call on you. So at this point, I'd like to hand things over to Professor Anita McGann, uh, University Professor at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, and George E. Connell Chair, at the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management. Um, Anita will introduce today's speaker for us. Um, so go ahead, please, Professor. Thank you so much, Avery, and thanks to all of you for being here. Avery, uh, uh, thanks for that generous introduction. Uh, I also want to uh, let you all know that I am also uh, a faculty affiliate at the Byrne Center for Social Change with Beth. Uh, uh, professor Beth Simone Novak is, is a professor at Northeastern University where she directs the Byrne Center for Social Change. And she also directs the GovLab, which is a partner project uh, that uh, has its heritage in New York. At Northeastern, she's she is a faculty at a wide range of schools. And I want to just give you an overview just so you get a sense of her interests. She's at the Institute, Institute for Experiential AI. She's a professor at the School of Law at Northeastern. She's in the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, in the College of Arts, Designs, and Media, the College of Engineering, and also uh, the College of Computer Scientists. Uh, a MacArthur Fellow, her work is on AI to reimagine participatory democracy and strength in governance. But what Beth is really most, uh, most about is impact. Uh, several of the students who are on this call uh, might be most impressed by some of her civic technology projects. Uh, she uh, has been a long-term innovator creating Unchat, which was an online platform for dem democratic engagement that was established uh, decades ago. She's been involved in peer to patent connections. Uh, and even two decades before we had, we had the metaverse, she built a, a platform called Democracy Island in Second Life. Uh, for me, what's been striking as well is that she served in the White House as the very first uh, United States De uh, Deputy Chief Technology Officer, and that was under President Obama. She's founded many, many different open governance uh, initiatives, including the White House Open Government, Government Initiative. Uh, she's made uh, data.gov uh, and challenge.gov uh, a wonderful forum for sharing information about government activities. She has designed uh, a program called Ask a Scientist to crowdsource answers to COVID questions. Uh, and she's also a great educator. She's uh, running big public open courses, such as a course called Solving Public Problems. She is also the Chief uh, Innovation Officer for the state of New Jersey. Please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Beth uh, Novak. Anita, thank you so much for that uh, gracious introduction. I am very, very honored by the invitation today. And all of that work around impact really has been inspired by years of collaboration with you and your long-term history um, and influence, I think, broadly across the academy and on a variety of disciplines, including on me, in encouraging and helping organizations to be more mission-driven. So uh, what I do is inspired very much by what you do, and it's why we've... Um, been colleagues for so long. So I'm really 
very delighted to be here. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen uh, and try to show some slides. Uh, hopefully that's working. And I'm going to start right off the bat before I even dive in. So I don't forget with a quick plug, since you mentioned Northeastern University, I would be remiss with this group if I didn't say, since I hope there are some students here or postdocs and doctoral students, that there are some job openings in the democracy and technology field and in what they're calling digital civics across a whole variety of disciplines. So feel free to ask me about those. Okay, commercial, end of commercial. Uh, but I promised a couple of deans that I would uh, spread the word. And given that this is a talk about tech and democracy, I thought there might be some interested parties here. Um, so what I'm going to do today, sorry for the typo, uh, is to try to talk a little bit about some of that history of innovation, Anita, that you began with, um, and really trace some of the history of how we've thought about democracy and technology over the course of my career in this field, and what I think AI means for us now as we embark on this new sort of revolution in generative AI. Um, so some of you may know that back in December 9th of 1968, the famous innovator Doug Engelbart did a 90 minute demonstration in San Francisco in which he showed all of what we think of today as the modern kind of core elements of modern computing. So hypertext, graphics, navigation, word processing, video conferencing, and showed how all these things could function together in a single system. Perhaps most amazingly of all, he connected remotely with the Augmentation Research Center at Stanford's Research Institute. And he was able to toggle nimbly between a video conference with his colleagues in Stanford and the presentation that he was showing in San Francisco. He received a standing ovation for this presentation, which has become known as, and you can find in Wikipedia, as the mother of all demos. And you can watch it on YouTube still today because it inspired a whole generation of people and beyond to understand what was possible with regard to technology. Um, so we tend to know Engelbart is the person who invented the mouse and invented the hyperlink. But I think what he showed that day and what was perhaps most revolutionary and even more radical was that he showed a way for people to work together across a, across a distance. What he was showing is this idea that unlike his colleagues at Stanford, who were very interested in machine intelligence and machine technology and the idea of, again, artificial intelligence that had become a popular term since the Dartmouth conference a decade before, was he was very focused on this idea of putting people before the technology and enabling collective intelligence, not just machine intelligence. Um, and so it was really inspired by that idea and that work. And I think there's a longer topic to be had here about the division in the field of study between those people who think about machines as augmenting humans um, uh, and those people who think about uh, how we can make machines replace humans. Um, it, this was very much an inspiration for a lot of my own work, which, as Anita alluded to, started with a project we did back in 1999. I don't know, Anita, I don't think in all these years I've ever shown this before. Um, but back in 1999, we created a piece of software that we called Unchat, in which a group could come together across a distance and have a real-time conversation. I believe it may be, or at least we thought of it as the time, as one of the first pieces of software designed to enable participatory or deliberative democracy across a distance. We had this very aspirational and perhaps hubristic notion that we were going to reinvigorate Athenian democracy in the form of software. Um, so in the classical age of Athens, of course, citizens participated in running the life of the polis. Uh, they were chosen by sortition to, for a wide variety of roles, as we know. And so we use this idea to enable a system in which the software would enable the community to run its own conversation. So my partner in crime here was the uh, uh, unfortunately now late political philosopher, Benjamin Barber. Um, and let me just say that when you start a software company with a political philosopher, it helps to explain why I'm in academia instead of a billionaire. Um, but we did have some fun with these early experiments and a lot of early successes in terms of driving conversations that people could moderate for themselves. So that functionality you see at the bottom of the screen, the moderation functionality, whereby a participant would type a comment 
it would arrive in the message queue on the bottom left for the moderator to then with one click either post or bounce or hold the message. That functionality uh, transitioned from user to user in the conversation on the basis of time or election. So every few minutes, the screen would change and you would have, you would have received the moderation functionality. People had to take turns running the conversation and the idea was by doing so, you would learn to become a better moderator and we would and we did have more civic minded, more civilized, more uh, um, authentic conversations as a result of putting people in charge of running them, as a result of creating a participatory, uh, instilling participatory values into the tech that we were using. So fast forward, um, we have seen, and I have seen over the course of the last 20 years, many successes in terms of efforts to incorporate uses of participatory democracy, deliberative rules and ideals into the way that we run conversations online. So we've seen commercial examples like Inocentive, which has now become renamed uh, Wazoku Crowd. Sorry, I still don't, uh, hard to get my head around the new name. Because for 20 years, this was called Inocentive and of course has had thousands of people collaborating on solving problems together online. Um, and of course, we are very familiar with the world of crowdsourcing and um, actually I'll go forward here for a second, uh, of crowdsourcing and open innovation experiments whereby people have come together in communities across a distance to try to make decisions. This is probably still the most famous of all of those crowdsourcing exercises is Bodie McBoatface. Um, and while this was largely ridiculed and of course they ultimately named the vessel uh, something else, uh, um, I think the idea of Bodie McBoface has helped to capture the notion um, that people can come together across a distance and solve hard problems together. Anita mentioned a project that I was involved in a number of years ago, back in 2005. We designed the first uh, really open innovation system in government where we enabled communities of scientists and technologists to assist the patent office with examining patent applications in order to improve the quality of the resulting applications by getting distributed intelligence and bringing it into the process. Um, so there's a lot we could say and we could talk for hours and I have written many books on the topic and many others have written about the topic of web-enabled, tech-enabled, participatory democracy. Um, but I wanna offer a critical note here as we move forward to talk about AI. As much as there were successes, and again, many of them which I'm skipping over right now and I'm alighting, and lots of early examples also of governments getting in on the act, not just companies and reaching out to citizens to engage with them. You know, Estonia started back in 2002 with a platform called ERIC, E-R-I-I-K, asking citizens to get involved in writing legislative proposals. Sweden had a platform called Vodia Empowerment, um, where again, they enabled deliberative dialogues among citizens to participate in decision-making. So lots of good examples. But this first flush of excitement, I think that we saw in the early days of the World Wide Web, also unleashed a torrent of examples of online engagement, e-democracy, whatever you wanna call it, tech-enabled engagement, that really has not worked. And I will take part of the blame here. I will heap the criticism upon myself because I was involved in this project, the Citizens Briefing Book, where in the early days of the Obama administration, before the administration started, when it was still the transition between election and inauguration, that we launched a project called the Citizens Briefing Book, and we asked citizens to propose policies for the first 100 days of the Obama administration. Well, what happened? Uh, as you might imagine, Obama was very, very popular at the beginning of his administration, and 84,000 people sent in comments. As you may imagine, uh, if I asked you what happened with those comments, uh, and I know we're supposed to do discussion later, um, so I'll just make it a rhetorical question right now. Uh, but of those, all those comments that people submitted, the short answer is absolutely nothing happened. We had no wherewithal to translate that insight into action 
in any way. It was just an outpouring of talking with nobody able to listen. Take the example of uh, the FCC's rulemaking on net neutrality. So in the United States, you have the right under the Administrative Procedure Act of 1946, everybody has the right to comment on draft federal rulemakings. For the most part, nobody participates and nobody comments except a handful of lobbyists. But now and again, when the media advertises a rulemaking, you get what happened in the case of the FCC, and they've had multiple rulemakings on net neutrality over the years, and it's coming back around again. Um, but in the, the kind of best known one, this is back in um, 2017, uh, there were 22 million comments. Uh, and of those 22 million comments, according to Pew Research, only 6% were actually original comments. Meanwhile, the agency was beleaguered by this deluge of content. Look around the world to Madrid, where they launched an early and successful, by all accounts, initially, platform called Decide Madrid. I say successful because 400,000 people signed up. And those 400,000 people submitted proposals via the website for policies they wanted the city council to enact. But of the 28,000 proposals that people submitted, Think about the number of hours of time that that's involved, the trust and the hope that people had for their voices to matter. Only one proposal actually moved forward. So I won't go into the details now. Happy to talk about why this succeeded so little. But I think we've had a lot of examples of uh, efforts to engage the public that have not been successful. I'll gild the lily a little bit more with one or two more examples. This one from um, uh, uh, Milwaukee, um, not, Mil not Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but Milwaukee, Oregon, um, a small town that ran a what's called a citizen's jury, where they took a representative sample of citizens. Um, this one was not so much tech enabled, but I wanted to use it because it's a great example of what happens in these projects. They... Uh, worked hard to get a representative sample of citizens. So that means in paneling, uh, they sending e sending mail to something on the order of 10,000 people in order to recruit a sample of 20 people whose sole job it was to decide on a raise for members of the city council from something like 300 to $320. I don't have it in front of me, but the cost of doing this, just the monetary cost, the versus the amount of money that was at issue is just sort of laughable. Um, and so lots of examples of these kinds of things um, you would think would make this sort of go away very quickly, but in fact, they're proliferating. So there has been an explosion of interest in what is sometimes called sortition or sometimes called citizen juries or deliberative polls. In other words, efforts to get representative groups of citizens together again, previously offline, now increasingly online, to deliberate on an issue. Just last year, Stanford did one of their deliberative polls uh, in which they had over 6,000 people from 32 countries uh, uh, who were selected to participate in an experiment with Meta, Facebook, to deliberate about online bullying. Um, wonderful press from Stanford, fantastic results in terms of the social science, looking at how, who was included, how people participated, how much they liked the, uh, the how much they liked it. But in the end, what happened? Nothing. Absolutely nothing changed and nothing about what face Facebook didn't do anything in response to people's concerns about online bullying. Um, and yet these proliferate. So just recently, OpenAI announced that it was going to put out grants, which they just awarded, um, to do more of these kinds of sortition experiments, getting representative samples of people together to engage in deliberation. Now, before I move on to talk about uh, AI in a moment, I do want to say that there are many, many things that are working. And I would be remiss if I didn't give uh, a tip of the hat for the moment to some things that have worked in this representative citizen engagement space, like what they're doing in Belgium, 
where they have not done these kind of one-off experiments with no consequences, but rather they have institutionalized representative participation into how their regional parliament makes decisions. So they've had now for several years a standing committee of ordinary people participating in legislative decision making. And what's interesting here, again, no tech involved here, but it is an institutionalized process that actually ties citizen engagement to actual outcomes and decision making. So I did want to, whoops, wrong way. I did want to mention that lest I uh, lest I didn't make it clear or, or suggested that nothing ever works. And in fact, many, many things have worked and that's going to inform some of our conversation about where we're going. Um, some of this, I think, deficit in democratic efficacy of the engagements that we've seen on the web long predate technology. There are historical antecedents and roots that we could talk about um, that really, you know, and that are very ancient when we talk about sort of ultimately a distrust of citizen participation. So the notion that citizen engagement, that participatory democracy is the greater good is not a given. We may think of it that way and we may pay lip service to that today as the greater good. But I think there have been periods throughout history in which, again, the idea has resurfaced. But for the most part, the platonic ideal of the philosopher king really has dominated how we've thought about governance. Uh, and I love the fact I came across this um, little example uh, in the book of, of um, my colleague uh, from Northeastern, um, whose name I'm going to remember in a second, <laughs> uh, uh, um, who writes about the fact that in England, you know, until 1948, we had the concept that the wealthy people could vote multiple times. They could vote in multiple places. If you went to Oxford or Cambridge, you could vote in Oxford or, and Cambridge, and then you could vote in your house in London, your your townhouse in London, and you could vote in, uh, you know, your manor house in the country uh, and everywhere else in between because of the, the view, um, the million concept that really educated people should have more right to participate. We have not been of the view that citizens have had the competence, um, the patience, uh, or the wherewithal to be able to participate in our democracy. And there is a long history in academia of many, many books, much scholarship that has been written about essentially the irrationality, the irrelevance, and the meaninglessness of citizen participation. Um, and really, even some of kind of the most famous democratic theorists have really had very dim, I think, and limited views about the role of ordinary citizens of participating in political life. Um, we could probe this even deeper and ask whether there isn't a systemic racism and systemic bias that underlies this view. Um, but I think we have had a political theory for a long time that has largely not supported these concepts. Um, you know, marry that, I think laying the blame at the feet of the academy isn't really, you know, fair uh, in terms of most of the blame. Most of the blame comes from the fact that we have had so much money corrupting our political system for so long, uh, so much lobbying, so many dollars that, you know, if you look at the work of uh, Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson, winner takes all politics and many books besides and lots that's been written, in short, the ordinary person has an almost negligible impact on political life in this country. And in fact, survey data from um, the OECD shows that across 22 countries, most people feel that they have very little, uh, there's, a, there's a large number of people that feel they have absolutely no voice in their political system. Um, this is, by the way, my uh, Dolly 3's rendering, which is absolutely meaningless of that statement, but I thought it was so cute. I wanted to put it in, even though it um, has very strange little unhappy looking light bulbs and bizarre looking statistics, but I just like the picture uh, of the unhappy looking people having no voice uh, uh, to illustrate this concept that most people distrust government across a majority of countries and don't feel that their voice particularly matters as part of the process. So we thought and we had hoped that the web was going to change everything. We had the hope that the ideal of participatory democracy that many people like Benjamin Barber 
um, talked about for so many years, or feminist political scientists like Carol Pateman wrote about, and others who have written about, um, uh, especially people who have written about social movements and about race and about feminism and the role in democracy, we really thought the web was going to do something for us. Um, and in fact, I, you know, the question is whether it has or not. Um, and Applebaum, of course, wrote this well-known article from the Atlantic a year or two ago referring to so democracy's dumpster fire. I rather like the term, um, essentially saying that tech is, you know, is is a, a, a sort of is has been a disaster for democracy. And I sort of like this title from the Atlantic: "The Internet could be so good; it could have been so good, but we went wrong." Okay. So now to the point, if you will. I mean, that was the point, but now to the second point. The second point is the argument that I want to make that the World Wide Web made it really easy for us to talk, but it didn't necessarily make it easy for us to be heard. And that's where AI can make a difference. And here's where I want to make the case. So generative AI we're familiar with now. It is, by the way, you may not know this. Oops, no, wait, okay. where? Here it is. Today is ChatGPT's one year birthday. Happy birthday, ChatGPT. It's hard to believe. Um, but it's a year ago that this tool got unleashed. The most popular, yes, there you go, Daniel, thank you, um, uh, got unleashed on us. Uh, and so we know that it's been a fantastic boon for our ability to create content. Um, so, you know, you can generate all kinds of text with it, uh, and it will put out really useful, um, information and you can generate, uh, lots of ideas. I have no idea whether this is true, but Toronto friends, you can tell us if that's the case. Um, I just learned, I had to look up what is the, what is the home dish of Toronto? I did not know it was sushi pizza. Apparently, uh, this is widely discussed online. But, uh, you know, I'm from New York. We have the we have the pizza. Some California has the burrito. Apparently you have sushi pizza. Um, so go figure. Sushi pizza is a unique dish that combines elements of Japanese sushi with the form of a pizza. It's a popular fusion dish in Toronto. While best can be subjective, many locals rave about the sushi pizza from Japango. They're known for their quality ingredients and the unique combination of flavors. Another place to try. Oops. There we go. Um, let me resume the share there. Uh, so the exciting thing is that the content when we can create is also multimodal. It doesn't just type, it can actually talk and we can talk to it. Um, and it's wonderful at this, at content creation. But what I think is even more exciting than the content creation that we're familiar with and the image generation that we can now do um, is really, and here's my nod to my New York, uh, to my New York roots. Um, uh, and I'll save you that this one is really cute, but I will, uh, no, I'll show it to you because it's the birthday. So, uh, and we can personalize a lot of that content. I'm going to show you, let's see if that works. Greetings, good sirs. May I have the pleasure of knowing your names? I'm Matt and that's Vache. A pleasure to meet you, Matt and Vache. Shall we commence our journey? Okay, I'll stop there. Let me go back to the, let me see if I can find my slides again. Are you seeing the slides or are you seeing YouTube? Okay, good. Um, so we can create content. We can personalize how that content gets created. That is the new Boston Dynamics tour robot, which has multiple different personalities and voices and costumes, I might add. And we'll give you a tour of the Boston Dynamics facility. Um, but what I think is more important for democracy almost is not the fact that we can generate content, but that we can analyze content, that we can sort and group and bucket content using AI in exciting ways. So the example we're probably all most familiar with is, of course, what our phone does, right? So every now and again, your phone will say to you, or at least mine does, um, maybe you would like, here, let me show you your memories of your summer vacation or the places you've the the sushi pizza restaurants you've been to in Toronto, or maybe you would like to see the memory of all the, you know, pets in your life. Um, so it sorts through all your photos for you and does this grouping and categorization, um, even without being told to do so. 
So that ability to sort data and to structure even unstructured content, I think is the most powerful feature for democracy. So one more example here, and then I will show you how and why. So, so uh, Anita and I have a colleague at the Burn Center who is working on a book about the rise of the right-wing Supreme Court. And so we were looking together at uh, this data set that comes uh, of from R Street who, to compile all the data of Supreme Court confirmations. And we were able to take that data and upload it and then say, show me the patterns that you see in the questioning of Supreme Court justices. So asked it like about all the times uh, Supreme Court justice candidates before the Senate were asked about uh, abortion. Uh, so uh, again, just showed this as just showing this as an example of the very rapid ways, and even with large quantities of data, without knowing what you're looking for, you can find patterns in the data. So how does all of this apply to democracy? What does this enable us to do? So that sorting, that content analysis can make it much easier for previously voluminous citizen comments to now become something that we can make sense of. A few years ago, the Burns Center ran a project with the government of Oakland, California called the Oakland City Challenge, in which we asked residents for their ideas for how to solve the problems of illegal dumping, violent crime, and homelessness. And we heard from lots of people. We heard from this wonderful woman named June Lee, who had this passionate vision for the idea of tiny homes for the formerly incarcerated and homeless. And she had great ideas about why, after many years in prison, you actually needed a bathtub because that was one thing you didn't have when you were incarcerated and having a bath was something people were yearning for. Many people are elderly, so you needed it to be built on one level rather than with stairs. Um, and she had a great vision for what to do, but it was very hard to realize that vision because with hundreds of comments on the site, people, there were many, many people writing in about homelessness and about the idea of tiny homes, and they didn't have any way to find each other. They were writing duplicative proposals and not hearing what one another had said. City officials on the other side, again, overworked, beleaguered, having a hard time getting through all the comments. Um, so now, whoops, I think I'm missing the example. Here it is. Let me go back a slide here. Um, now, thanks to the integration of ChatGPT, the nonprofit that built the technology on which that ran, they've integrated ChatGPT under the hood. And now I can say, tell me about the five ideas for gun control that are on the site. Tell me about the uh, the best five ideas for homelessness. Tell me who's writing about this. Summarize the ideas for that. Creates now with this kind of in, engagement assistant or engagement chatbot, if you will, it now creates the ability for people not only to talk, but to hear. There's another group called Citizen Lab. Full disclosure, I'm on their board. They are a small company out of Belgium. They've been using AI for quite a number of years uh, uh, before generative AI, natural language processing, to be able, again, to explore the comments that people are making, to cluster them, to group them, to find the topics and to find the themes. And now that's getting even easier to do. There are new projects like the DPASS website out of Hamburg, which is being copied across many cities. Um, so on the left, you see Hamburg's dashboard. On the right, you see the dashboard from Leipzig, um, which are, again, turning to AI, not only to enable people to make comments about um, urban planning in the city, but to sort, to organize, to visualize, uh, and to be able to listen to the comments that are being made, not just government officials, but also citizens one to the other. So um, examples, uh, too, of using technology to enable this to be done, not just in text or in typing, but also orally. I wanted to show you the multimodal, the spoken aspects of AI, because I think it's really important when talking about low literacy individuals, non-English speaking individuals, people who may not feel comfortable with text. Um, what Deb Roy, professor at MIT, is doing with the Cortico project is really exciting. He refers to the device in the middle of the table as the digital hearth. It's essentially a very pretty casing 
what's basically like a Siri or an Alexa. It's a recorder that essentially records the conversation and then very rapidly does analysis on what are the themes, what are people talking about, what's the sentiment, it helps to sort and organize the conversation, much as Zoom is doing now as we're recording this conversation and Zoom will both transcribe but also summarize and extract what we said today. Um, so I think that ability now for people to be able to talk but also then to organize the content is really exciting. But I would be remiss if I didn't say that the ability to help people who do have trouble expressing themselves to do so on a level footing and a level playing field um, is also exciting. So I put in here, you know, just an example. If I want to ask ChatGPT, write me a 50 word proposal for a plastic bag tax. And of course, it spits out immediately at my direction 50 words. I can tell it to give me 100 words or something else. So imagine that I am a citizen who has a good idea for something I want to see happen, but I don't have the ability or the education or the comfort or frankly the time to be able to write eloquently. Um, the tools can also help me to do that so that I can participate on a level playing field. My students are working on a project right now to use these tools to enable citizens. Uh, uh, and by the way, when I say citizens, I don't mean it as a term of art. I mean, perhaps the better word is resident. Uh, immigrants are included here. I just say citizen to mean member of, a com of our communities. So let me be clear about that very much. Um, we're doing a project right now where uh, we are using ChatGPT to take, let me go forward a, a slide here, to take the individualized education program, the usually 100 page PDF that parents get in connection with their child who may have a learning disability or other disability and needs an accommodation in school. And this is, by the way, upwards of 15 to 20% of all public school children in the United States have such a plan. Right now, that plan is a document that has to get discussed and negotiated and agreed upon. Whoops, sorry, let me go, I've lost my slide here. By all of these people, uh, in leads to a 100 page PDF, which again, if you are non-English speaking, non-native in the tongue of the community, low literacy, can be extraordinarily difficult for you to understand, let alone to advocate for what you need for your child. So now along comes generative AI and machine learning and natural language processing and tools like the open source toolkit Seamless M4T, which was developed by Meta. This is real-time translation from speech to text, from text to text in a hundred languages, and from speech to speech in 35 languages. And this is a powerful tool. Um, I recommend it to you. It is you know, light years ahead of Google Translate in terms of what it can do and the speed with which it can do translation. And the tools are all open source, meaning they can be tapped to do things like help people understand the government services to which they're entitled. There are also exciting experiments now that are enabling residents to get involved in co-designing and truly participating in decision-making with governments. So in Helsinki and cities around the world, they're turning to a toolkit called Urbanist AI, which makes it very easy, not just to generate now pictures of rats with pizza, but to actually generate images of your own community and how you would like to see the urban landscape change. And what they're doing is running co-design sessions in communities to help citizens advocate for what they would like to see in their community. Just yesterday, I saw the announcement for a new toolkit. I think it might be built on some of the same tools. I have to find out, but released by a group called Dutch Cycling Lifestyle. So I put in your street, which according to uh, uh, the web tells me looks like this. And uh, with AI, it shows me that it could look like this, or perhaps it could look like this. So imagine the ability now for us to engage in a conversation about how we want the community to look with members of the community, whether or not they have the skills or not from a literacy perspective. Okay, I don't wanna keep going too much longer, so let me just spend five minutes to tell you about some experiments that I'm working on right now and that I'm hoping we can talk about.
So there's been some research that's been done in the last year, really looking at how integrating generative AI into how people work is changing the way people work and increasing productivity. Um, business school people here will be very familiar with this work that came out recently. That's about consultants using generative AI with dramatic results in terms of increasing productivity. Um, and there have been, again, more studies that have shown that um, we still, you know, humans are still pretty, pretty good at doing things, but humans plus machines, you know, are really kind of doing a remarkable things in terms of problem solving. Um, and so this is the last set of the last ex sort of experiment or examples that I want to show you. And I want to connect it back to what we were talking about before. One of the big challenges, I think, with how we've done things on the web up until now was we have been so focused on how to make things simple that we have often made them so simplistic as to be relatively useless. So we have had these processes like citizen submits a proposal to the city council of Madrid or citizen submits a proposal to the government of Oakland. But to make it really easy for citizens, we have these very um, sort of stripped down bare bones things that lead to large volumes of submissions without the quality, without the information, without the data that we actually need to make effective proposals. So we've been looking at how we can integrate chat GPT and how we can integrate generative AI into a more complex decision-making process. So we, over the last few months, have been doing a process that we call smarter crowdsourcing, where we bring groups of humans together, and this is something we've done for a long time, to work on solutions to hard problems. In this case, at the behest of a foundation, we were asked to look for novel ideas for how to solve a variety of challenges relating to election subversion. So we had different topics that we focused on, one of which was misuse of the legal system to uh, things like people bringing malicious lawsuits. Think Sidney Powell. Think all these people pleading guilty now, the Sidney Powells of the world, people bringing malicious freedom of information um, request simply to beleaguer and uh, sort of deluge the system. And the question was, what can we can do about this? So we brought together dozens of people to answer that question, and we got lots of good ideas. But then what we did was we also asked Chief Chat GPT, um, what can we? What are the solutions that we can that you have to the same problem? And we were able to compare the ideas. The provided by the humans and provided by the AI, and quite re maybe remarkably, depending on your view, maybe not remarkably, everything that the humans came up with, ChatGPT came up with, and in fact, we got some ideas besides the Chat G that the humans had not come up with as part of the process. The way that we do that is not just saying, "Hey, give me some ideas." We run a rather complex process where we essentially are. Uh, mining vast quantities of research data using the API from GPT um, to look at vast quantities of research papers and mine that for solutions to the problem that we're looking for. We then rank and rate those problems, rank and rate those solutions. And I, I won't belabor the details here in the interest of time. Um, we do this both for the problem we're trying to solve and all the solution, but let me just focus on the solution for the moment. We rate and rank the solutions using what's sometimes called ELO scoring. So Arpad ELO was the chess grandmaster who invented the scoring system that's used in chess that essentially says we're going to rate a chess player not based on how many games they win, but how many games you win against opponents who are better than you. Just to summarize, essentially, we are rating the ideas one against the other for the best ideas in terms of easiest to implement, in terms of most cost effective, in terms of most beneficial for minority communities. In short, we can rate, we can use GPT to rate and rank ideas across a wide variety of metrics, enabling us to develop solutions and then to write them out in intelligible English. We're doing this experiment again. We're now running this process right now in connection with another project about literacy, where again, we asked ChatGPT in this case, not to help us find solutions, 
but to help us identify root causes to the problem of low literacy. And ChatGPT generated for us over 3,000 different root causes to the problem across a wide variety of themes. And then we were able to use this scoring to come up with um, a list of uh, a list of top rated but most diverse root causes. And then we took those root causes and I just did this very quickly, this is not very good, and sort of threw it into GPT and said, give it to me in the language of a fourth grader. Why did I do that? I did that because now we're gonna take the content developed by the machine and we're gonna go out, oops, let me keep going here. We're gonna go out and ask humans, what do you think are the root causes? So all that to say, we've run the process now asking humans and then asking the machine, now asking the machine and then asking humans against two different topics. And we really wanna understand what's gonna work better. I'll close by just saying um, one cautionary note here, that as we think about doing these kinds of mixed method, let me call them AI plus human decision-making processes, we have to resist the temptation only to ask the AI. And especially given the fact that the AI is so good at coming up with solutions that humans come up with, it is very tempting to resort only to silicone samples, especially if you say, oh, then I don't have to pass the IRB. I could just ask ChatGPT. There's gonna be a lot of temptation not to go out and ask the humans. I think we desperately need to go out and, and figure out how we can make true citizen engagement that is actually leads to real outcomes and decision-making better, faster, easier, and more equitable by giving it the boost of AI, but without replacing the human experience. So I will stop there, uh, leave us with a set of questions that we're asking ourselves, and I'm happy to talk more about the results, and I'm gonna um, turn it back over to questions. Wow, thank you so much, Beth. That was an amazing talk. Very, very interesting. Um, so we'll move now into our Q&A portion. Um, so just as a reminder, uh, please use the raised hand uh, function on Zoom. You can write your question in the chat. Uh, if you can ask a question, uh, we would love it if you could turn your camera on to ask the question. Uh, and our team will then send a request for you to unmute uh, when it's your turn to speak. And we do have the first questions coming from Anita. So go ahead, Anita, if you want to start us off. Thanks. We have a lot of questions in the chat. So I'm just going to ask one question, Beth. And thank you again for that um, fascinating talk. This is something I know you've thought about a lot. Um, and I just wanted to ask for your reflect reflections on it. So, you know, the first section of your talk was about the failure of the promise of the internet um, in in, in, in generating actionable or even actioned, let me say actioned um, uh, responses to the tremendous outpouring of information from, from what you call citizens or more broadly residents of, of communities here. So we have at the heart of the internet failure, not a lack of expression by people, but a lack of sort of a catcher's mitt or a lack of response by governmental agencies and public figures uh, for that tremendous outpouring of sentiment. We also, and this is implicit in some of the examples you gave, we also have some idea that people aren't very good at expressing themselves. You know, they, they don't, they're not very good at e e explaining what their root cause of their problems are, um, such as uh, by uh, fourth graders who, who, who don't know how to express that they don't know the words they don't know uh, in the literacy exp experiment. How does AI solve the very core problem of trying to figure out what people need, you know, behind behind this enormous clue they need to be able to express themselves, but be but in that expression, they're not very good at ex explaining the the kind of the root cause of their needs um, here. How does AI help us solve that problem? So let me say right off the bat, um, so that is a as as expected a rather sophisticated question um, and a really good one. AI by itself doesn't solve anything. A, of course, it's how we use these tools, um, and you know that is uh, that's at the root of all of this. And you know the upshot 
which I should have ended with and 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 we'll just say is that we're not going to see you know really significant and institutionalized uses of AI to enable participatory democracy if we don't invest in it. Um, and in fact, there's very little, you know, there's lots of these pockets of experiments and cool tools and this happening and that happening. But, you know, we saw a lot of that with the web as well. And again, that failure to institutionalize, to create that catcher's mitt on the institutional side, as you know, has been my preoccupation for most of my career. Um, I don't, I think one of the, uh, so back to the kind of the core of your question, I think there's two parts to this. One is, it's why we can't have you know, when we're one form of decision making, one ring to rule them all. So the notion that people would create some app and like, ah, that's how we would do citizen engagement is, you know, it's not how complex decisions are made. We have to start by really discussing what is the problem? What are the root causes of the problem? Um, why do we understand those to be the root causes? We then have to gather data and evidence about those root causes so we can understand why something is actually happening. Then we need to move on to thinking about solutions. Um, how do the, you know, we can come up with lots of solutions, but which solutions are actually implementable? You know, what fits within the political reality of where we are? Then we have to think about how do we implement things? So a lot of the challenges we've tried to sort of sprinkle a little engagement in one place. Um, but if you're not thinking throughout about, you know, we've seen some success with open innovation and it's where we've seen this kind of, you know, user innovation in specific elements of um, the business process where, you know, in suppliers, you know, Eric's work on sort of suppliers developing innovations for companies or, you know, customers coming up with the Bodie McBoatface idea, you're slogan for your next commercial or whatever. So we we throw those things in. Um, but to your point, like there is opportunity to really get at what people know a lot is their problem. So you got to be asked, you got to ask them about what the problem is. But some people also really have good ideas about the solution. So you also have to ask that. Um, and then we might have a solution in mind, but then people can tell you, like, in my community, that's just not going to fly and for the following seven reasons. Um, so in short, I think the way that we, it's not that everybody can do all of these things. It's that we need multiple yeah. ways for people to engage. Um, and it's precisely why that literacy project is about identifying root causes of problems as identified by people in communities who are suffering from those problems. Um, okay, let me leave it at there because we have a lot of questions. And that was a not a good answer to a to a wonderful question, which uh, we can talk more about. That was a great answer, and there's a lot going on. Avery, do you want me to call through the chat, or are you up for it? Um, yeah, I can. I, I think next we'll go to our senior director, uh, Jillian Hadfield, please. Great, thanks, thanks, Beth. That was just just terrific. Um, and I wanted to just get you to expand a little bit more on the institutionalization part of things and the implementation. You've given us great, um, um, really uh, eye-opening ideas about how we can help generate uh, solutions that are more tuned to the root causes and to communities, and that's terrific. But you've mentioned in your answer to Anita the importance of institutionalizing and implementing. Uh, both kinds of solutions. So I'm trying to think about how this works. I've been thinking about this in the um, the context of the democratic inputs into choosing the principles, for example, that we want generative AI to follow. And then saying from a legal perspective, well, a ton of the actual work of figuring out what we think is okay and not okay is through um, adjudication and uh, those kinds of processes, which I also think are critical parts of democracy. So if we're thinking about solutions on literacy, for example, um, and when I think about how that, well, first of all, the gaps we see between coming up with solutions, having solutions, and actually getting those implemented. But on that back end, um, like, if, if we have humans coming up with ideas, sometimes what we really need is a real champion who just continues to push and adapt and move that idea forward. Um, is there Are there ways in which generative AI can be helping us on that? Or anyway, just let me just invite you to say more about what you're thinking on implementation. 
So you're right that there is, you know, there's a complex set of reasons why social change happens in different contexts. Um, and it isn't the case that there is sort of a tool that, you know, automatically translates into effective implementation. Um, as with that research study from Kareem Lakani and colleagues and uh, and Ethan Malik and others and um, who've been writing about sort of how consultants use these tools, they are, you know, ultimately they're productivity tools that can enhance our workflow, as they say in the jargon. Um, and so thinking about what the workflow is of citizen uh, uh, power and of movement building and of change, I think causes us to ask the question of how do we use these things? So take the example of the person who is the passionate leader who wants to advocate for an idea. You can see how things like the ability for this to draft for you, to write for you, to help you make a poster, um, could be just the thing that somebody needs to help give them voice. Um, the idea of, you know, platforms that enable us to really sift through the content on the site. So the, what I showed you about sort of that ability to say, hey, show me what are the best ideas on this site uh, or show me the top ideas on this topic or, you know, slice and dice it various ways can help us find that diamond in the rough, the person who's proposing something. Um, but obviously sort of having, you know, and having institutions that institutionalize these processes, like none of this happens. The opportunity for citizen power to manifest itself doesn't happen as well if institutions aren't asking. And if institu and its institutions don't ask because they don't know how to do it and it's not very efficient and it's hard for them to do and it doesn't result in something that they can actually use. So you don't get a lot of institutions doing this or they do it once, but then they don't act on it. Then they don't repeat it because again, it's like a lot of people shouting at me, a bazillion comments, you know, a lot of comments, but I can't really do anything with them. Um, so in part, I think it's the institutional obligation to create these mechanisms for actually sorting and sifting through what people say with an eye towards elevating those voices that would otherwise be lost and be buried. So some of it is like, oh, this can help me draft things because I might not be a very good speaker. Um, this can help me participate orally without even needing to type. Um, uh, and, but it's up to institutions then to say, I wanna go out and use these tools to ensure I'm empowering people who are low literacy. Um, so I think there's a variety of things here um, but there is a there is a bigger question about sort of how do people how do we create those mechanisms for people to make change? I was talking yesterday to one of the single most effective people uh, I've come across in recent years. Her name is Jennifer Erickson, and she has been sing single mindedly back of reforming the organ donation system in America and breaking the the monopoly of the kind of corrupt and monopolistic organization that has dominated that process. And according to Jennifer, organ shortages do not need to exist. They are artificially manufactured because of poor governance in how the whole system is run. And she has gotten Congress to pass legislation to change the system. Um, of course, I was on the phone with her yesterday because she said, we've got legislation, but now we're at risk of failing because of the procurement for the vendors to implement the new system. So we were talking about how to overcome that. I just wanted to give a shout out to her phenomenal work um, and to flag that this is going on and really to say like at some level, like, of course you need those incredibly powerful people, but I think we can create mechanisms for more people to become the Jennifer Erickson's of the world. So let me leave it at that. Yeah, great, thanks, thanks so much. So next we have a question from our scholar in residence, Luke Stark. Luke, did you want it in your mic? Uh, thanks so much, Avery, and um, thank you so much uh, to this great talk. Um, uh, and, and Beth, I've loved your work for years. So I, I was a PhD student at NYU, so I, I remember. I remember when 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 things with got started there. Um, I, I have a lot of questions about implementation, but my my bigger question is about the business models of companies like OpenAI and how they might or might not um, kind of kind of kind of connect with the 
the outcomes of citizen democracy or the goal of citizen democracy. You know, so so my one worry I would have with what you're proposing is that you know thousands of citizen comments become training data to support OpenAI's further business ventures, right? In a way that might not be appealing to the people who are actually making citizens com citizen comments. But I so I wondered, I mean, is is part of this of this project looking at building open source or or public um LLMs, right, as a way to uh as a way to overcome that problem? Because I think, you know, you made a very compelling case for the utility of some of these systems, but I I I I wouldn't want this to become a kind of source of free training data for you know, a, a small set of very powerful AI companies. So I think there's um, two thought, two, two pieces to that. One is, I do think that citizen comments, public comments in a comment process, participation in most, I mean, we can talk about sort of different things, like the, the citizens sitting around that table at, with the digital hearth in Cortico, we may view a little differently from my typing comments on regulations.gov. If I type comments on regulations.gov, those are very much open data. I do not have, those are public and they're mm -hmm. intended to be public. They are public mm -hmm. comments. Um, the citizens briefing book uh, experiment, you know, those were public. Um, and I think, you know, so we, we are trying to have a public conversation there. So we do want those things to be public. So the, it, but the broader issue of proprietary systems, I think is very, very problematical. Um, we're working on the, some of the tech that I breezed through at the end, uh, this project that I should have told you the name of, which is called Policy Synth, um, is all on GitHub uh, with a group called Citizens Foundation out of Iceland um, that's doing the tech for this. But the underlying language model is GPT. Um, so I do think, you know, and and I am concerned, I will mention it I, um, because it came out this week, the new executive order from the White House, 111 pages on governance of AI um, that just came out this week. Um, I'm concerned that one of the byproducts of new regulations um, is that it's actually going to make it harder for open source language models. So requiring mm. people to do all of this uh, testing and red teaming and reporting and interact. I mean, we don't know yet what the event, the final rules will be. It's an executive order which says go out and make some rules. Um, but if it's too onerous, could actually be really difficult for development of non-commercial la large language models. I mean, it's a double-edged sword. We want these this oversight, but we have to be very careful that it's um, that people, you know, that something other than billion dollar companies can actually afford to comply because we have seen we've all I have to say is Twitter. Right. I mean, we've <laughs> seen what's happened to the public square. Um, the end. Right. <laughs> There's nothing more to say. Like we have ceded control over the public square to a bunch of, um, you know, well, whatever, I'll spare the commentary uh, more than I already have. But yeah, it's worrisome that the infrastructure would be completely proprietary for doing this. Uh, so um, I don't have great answers for that yet. Some of these tools and the problem is the big the underlying models themselves are so expensive to build. We don't really want to replicate the billions that are going into that it's much better to build these use cases that we can do free and cheap and easy but without an open source underlying model it's very concerning yeah great thank you i, I don't have a, i don't have a good answer to that except to say if we're not focused on questions of what are we doing with this if we're not talking about democracy like we will not invest we will not realize like we're not going to make those investments great thank you so now we'll take some questions from our graduate fellows and graduate affiliates, and we'll start with Blake Lee Whiting. Blake, if you can turn on your great. Wonderful. Um, hi, Professor Novick. That was a very wonderful talk. And as someone who's doing a PhD in politics and technology, it was very much uh, similar to a lot of my work. I was really, really impressed. Um, and I'm really convinced by your arguments that AI will make public consultation more effective, right? Uh, the policy and politics literature and public consultation is rich. You note Hacker and Pearson, Gillinson Page, other work, similar research. 
Um, but I'm thinking about like the trustee versus delegate model of democracy and necessarily how public consultation leads into the delegate model sort of solely. Um, this can be challenging when the policy questions are very complicated or technical uh, and public consultation can sometimes be misled by sorry, loud voices uh, opposed to difficult decisions. Tax policy, for instance, is notorious for these challenges. How do you think about the tensions between AI-informed public consultation and the challenges associated with delegate model policymaking in that context? Ooh. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm on mute. Um, really good. This is a good question. So I think the, um, you know, this is not necessarily, a, a, you know, limited to AI at all, or, or it's the question is, what are the kinds of, to your point, what are the kinds of processes that we're designing? Um, the point of the exploration of AI is, I think, and, and you said that uh, you were convinced by my argument that it would make citizen participation. I, I'm saying it could make citizen participation better. It, don't, not, it won't necessarily do that because um, I think it comes down to some of the questions and points that you're making here uh, about sort of how we're empowering people to make decisions um, and, you know, who is making the decisions and how we organize that process. Uh, and we have, of course, typically thought that we needed to have this uh, model by which we're delegating decision making to other people because they will make better decisions. They will be less influenced by the mob, by the crowd. They will be less subject to manipulation. I'm not sure that some of those assumptions <laughs> that have given rise to our representative system necessarily hold true with today's Congress. Um, but that's another topic for a for a for another day that is, is a, lo a long topic about what's happened to deliberative decision making and and uh, representative institutions. Um, I think, though, this idea that we can um, create use the AI to act as a check on the collective intelligence and vice versa. So I can go out and ask citizens and again, residents, I use the public. Uh, citizens is just a shorthand. Um, we can go out and ask the public something. We can go out and ask a representative sample of the public. We can go out and ask a non-representative sample. We can uh, let people self-select to participate. We can ask people, and then we can also ask AI, what kinds of things should I be seeing? Um, and that can help us to understand, you know, what's happening in the conversation. So for example, if, if you go back to that slide from Pew, uh, which had a lot of text on it, or that analysis of the 22 million people who participated in the rulemaking, uh, there were actually seven comments that accounted for, you know, 90% of the seven postings or seven entities, or seven, I wouldn't call them people, because it wasn't people back of them. There were really only seven comments that were 90% of the volume, because it was all manipulated astroturfing. Um, but I, so in other words, long story short, I could say, what kinds of things might I be hearing? Ah, if I'm not hearing that diversity of opinion, maybe there's some manipulation in the human process. So it might, I haven't really done any experimental work on this or sort of looked at this more closely, but I think the idea of, of looking at that question and asking how AI might help us, you know, reduce uh, manipulation in the process or allow us to understand better the quality of the information that could enable, um, you know, could enable us to listen to the voices that we're hearing more um, and make and, and, and create a better quality process, I think is a really interesting set of experiments that's worth doing and exploring how to do that. Um, and again, it works in the other direction too, where I can then use AI to create, as we're doing with this literacy thing, where we're starting and saying, here's a possible set of answer choices. And now we're gonna go out and ask people what they think. Um, they can still contribute other, they can still type in their own answers, but we're starting with a very diverse range of answers, a very diverse set of inputs um, that we have deliberately controlled for the diversity of those statements. Again, that may be sort of too vague without the image of it, but anyway, hope that begins to answer the question or raise more questions. That was a wonderful answer. Thank you very much. Okay.
Okay, great. So now we'll go to our graduate affiliate, Morgan McInnes. Hi, uh, you did actually just touch upon the question I wanted to ask, but uh, if you'll forgive me playing devil's advocate for just a moment, maybe I can approach it from a bit of a different angle. Um, so it seems like the goal here is to create tools which eliminate the collective action problem and barriers to entry into participation. And supposing you do that, um, and these tools don't have any technical limitations on any particular person using them, then does the constraining factor on participation become individual motivation? Um, so my suspicion is that even if these tools are not technically more accessible for one person than another, there would be this selection bias in favor of the most um, perhaps motivated or energized people and that a disproportionate amount of the engagement is going to come from them. Um, so my concern is that this might lead to some negative effects. So if those who are most motivated or dedicated um, might be motivated because they're part of a concentrated interest group uh, and that interest might diverge uh, from the larger population or because the reason they are particularly motivated is due to partisan commitments or something. Um, so I guess my question is, even if you eliminate these barriers to entry, is there still this self-selection effect on the user end? Um, so how important is that to technology-enabled participatory, participatory democracy? And I guess, how much of a problem should we anticipate that is? So I think it's a big problem and we've seen it with the web and we'll see it with with the, this what you know AI era in that when we allow people to self-select um we have both the manipulation issues of astroturfing and you know russian bots and trolls and etc um we have simply the motivation issue that you talked about in terms of people who have more time on their hands who are wealthier who are more educated and there's lots of experiments that have shown when self, when you let people self select, you um, uh, you know you certain people participate and others don't. Depending on the community, there's always a minoritized, uh, usually multiple minoritized populations that are left out. Um, which is why I think what's exciting here is if this making things faster, easier, and simpler in terms of not just creation of content but organization of content makes it easier to run multiple processes. So the um, what I didn't show is that in this literacy project we're doing, we start with a self-selected process where we invite people to respond. Um, and again, the self-selection gives you lots of wonderful things in terms of people who are passionate about the topic, who want to talk about it, who are engaged, et cetera. But then we will marry it with a representative sample. Uh, where we actually have, uh, you know, are sure that we're having popular representation, which will in turn be married with a process whereby we're oversampling for um, parents and students from uh, communities that have high rates of free school lunch uh, um, and low income. So we can actually oversample for uh, a typically sort of disenfranchised population. So in other words, it, the answer is you're a hundred percent right, which means you can't just do one thing. You have to do multiple things. And therefore to do multiple things, we have to bring down the cost and make it easier and make it faster to be able to do multiple things rather than just one. Um, but ultimately the issue of motivation, putting to one side the issue of money, and this gets to the question raised before that not only are these platforms often not uh, are, are proprietary, but they do cost money. So we have to ensure that they're free. Um, but the motivation factor comes first and foremost from seeing relevance to your work and participation. So there is the greatest motivation to doing something, to getting involved is the fact that it matters. So we have to have outcomes as part of the process. So whatever the process is, it has to lead to something. Otherwise people get angry and disenfranchised. And that's what you've seen a lot of in France 
as they've adopted more and more of these sortition experiments at the same time as people are taking the streets in these yellow vest protests. Um, and because, you know, you're going in to have a debate about end of life in a, in a citizens assembly or about climate change, and then nothing comes out of it. And that leaves people angrier and less trusting and more disenfranchised than when they started. End of, end of editorial. Uh, representative combined with non-representative participation is the answer. Hey, and Great, we have, thank you. Oh, oh sorry, yeah, okay. Uh, we have also a question from our graduate affiliate, Anne-Marie Fowler. Anne-Marie? Thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, I wondered, and my, my question follows a bit from Morgan, so the sequence was good here. I wondered if you could comment, um, does a power to sort group and bucket dynamically displace partisan frameworks? Um, I have had this kind of uh, on and off research topic about how partisan frameworks will uh, last or not last with the advent of AI-enabled democracy. So the parties as we know them, continuing from the 20th into the 21st century, have had kind of two catchersmith functions. One is finance related, they direct money, they collect and direct money. And the other is they create a knowledge binary structure. They allow big ideas to become filterable into two sets or two, you know, larger sets of, um, of, you know, of two information silos, if you will. And when you introduce the dynamic ability to suddenly go out and, and do the sortition in all kinds of creative ways, you challenge that framework and the power of that framework significantly, which I think is kind of exciting. And I've been involved with some uh, startups in the past that have tried some uh, shop and donate technologies to try to capture those that were in between partisan frameworks. This was in the US state of Pennsylvania, and this was actually during the reelect in 2012. Uh, so um, I wonder if you'd comment on that. What happens to political parties? What do you think? Thank you. I want to. I want to read this when you're done, uh, <laughs> or you're done. Uh, I think it's a really important observation. Uh, so it, it's a. It's really interesting. Um, you know what I like about some of these real time visualizations, and funny. The first first time I saw something like this, it's not machine learning or AI. There's a colleague of mine, um, former colleague of mine by the name of David Johnson. Mm -hmm. uh, that name, he sounds like a, the speaker of that. He sounds like a speaker of the house. He is I just thought of that, actually. Uh, I know, it's like the David. most generic name after Mike Johnson. Um, David right. R. Johnson was very well known for writing an article along with a law professor by the name of David Post um, that sort of was the first article to say cyberspace is its own jurisdiction. So David is the granddaddy of cyber law. He taught Larry Lessig cyber law, let me put it that way. Wow. Um, David did a project years ago um, that I'm trying to remember the name of it, but basically he was involved in some kind of a congressional b b task force that was debating some issue. And he went home one night and all, and what he did was he took people's viewpoints on the task force and he just plotted them on a map, you know, on a, on a graph. And basically you could see people were clustered, you know, once you once you map it, you could see, oh, most people are clustered here and here are the outliers. And then thanks to bringing in this infographic the next day, or I guess what we'd have just called a graph. <laughs> this is just, there was a piece of paper probably when this was done. Um, but he subsequently built tools to do this. You know, it dramatically changed the way the debate happened. Um, there was some wonderful work by a then PhD student named Joni D'Amico Morris, um, called social that referred to the concept of she went to IBM after that called social mirroring, which really referred to the idea of groups being able to see themselves reflected back in the screen and what that does for you. So I think it's really interesting. And one could look at data from something like Citizen Lab, which has been doing this for a long time. Um, what happens in a debate when I can see that sort of clustering? Um, when I can see where people stand on an issue, there might be other literature on this that I'm not familiar with. Um, but I, you know, I, I think it's, it, it can have, it will have really interesting effects on dialogue, 
what it does for political parties that want to control the dialogue, control the dialogue, control the narrative, shape what the topics are. Um, you know, that's a bigger institutional question because relinquishing that control is going to be very, very difficult. Um, because, and we've seen lots of examples of showing the data on, you know, what people think about climate change or what people think about abortion or what people think, and it has no effect on what it, political parties move further to the extreme because it, it helps secure their electoral chances from their base. Um, so there's, you know, complex dynamics to these things. But I think at the smaller scale, at least sort of the way debates happen um, that ability to cluster and sort and see what people are doing is really interesting. There's another tool that's very proprietary and commercial, not open source, that I'll put the name of in the chat, called Remesh that I've used before. Remesh is a uh, machine learning based platform that does focus groups for companies. And it uh, we've used it for uh, civic purposes, but it's primarily used for doing focus groups. And what they do is they're just sort of sorting very fast. So as people answer questions, you can say, show me what all the men think, show me what the women think, show what the more show what the richer people think and the poorer people and the this and the that. Um, and that ability to kind of slice and dice really quickly, it's one thing they use it. As the organizer, you can see that because it's meant right. for again, corporate focus grouping, like people tell, you know, do you like Coke or Pepsi? So the organizers can see it. But when everybody can see that, right. that has a significant impact on how people talk. All I've, I've now spent 10 minutes agreeing with you. So I just want to <laughs> know what you're working on. Thank you. <laughs> so Anita has signaled to me that she has another question. I do, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Beth, for you know, being with us today and for all these great ideas and the comprehensive responses to all these questions. I wanted to just ask you if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about some of the work you're doing at Innovation, at Innovate US and, and with um, the city of Boston. Many of the initiatives that you've described require that people in the public sector and government and local government as well as federal um, and, and uh, multinational agencies have skills that you know, reflect the demands of the technology. Would you mind just reflecting a little bit on the kinds of, uh, on those skills and, and the ways in which people in the public sector can acquire them? So in my copious spare time, Anita knows this is a softball. My great passion is the topic of upskilling um, because I'm a big believer in the fact that we have theorized for a long time about participatory democracy. We have talked about it. We've done experiments. And what I've seen is that there's a great deal. What I said earlier about the lack of commitment to democratic engagement, having been sort of largely the norm in the 20th century, I would say in the 21st, we're in a very different place where there's a great deal of commitment, especially centering it around equity. I wouldn't say in all in all corridors and communities, but um, there's definitely a sort of dominant narrative about participatory decision-making being a good thing um, that I'd like to think a lot of this web-based experimentation and the open government movement and whatnot has helped to engender. But what I see a lot of is a will with no way. People are very eager, but they have no idea how to do this. <laughs> They're really just literally, and you know, even at a more simple level, as we know, you know, we teach research methods in grad school. We teach people how to go out and do an interview. We teach people how to go out and um, talk to human subjects. We um, that is something we think we need to teach, but it is not something that if you are learning to be in government, that anybody necessarily teaches you. It's not part of the public administration curriculum, for example, to learn human centered design or engagement and surely with the tools i mean right now we're in a place where most people in government are don't use these tools at all or are afraid to use them there's a great deal of uncertainty um the executive order from the white house that came out on monday said federal departments and agencies may not ban generative ai but nor should they necessarily race to use it <laughs> that by the way omb came out with um, it's sitting right here, 26 pages of new guidance um, that I have yet to read uh, that might shed some light on this. But long story short, people have to know first how to use these tools. 
I mean, really, I, I talk to people all the time who have never tried chat GPT, or maybe they've tried it once to make a funny poem, but how do I use this? I don't think, you know, forget about democracy and citizen engagement. Like if you don't know how to ask a basic question on chat GPT, um, it can be very, very difficult. And even extremely busy, smart people, you know, because it involves changing fundamentally how we think, how we write, how we create, like people don't have time for this. Um, so it's not a criticism. It's really just the reality of where busy people are at. And then the part which is translating that into citizen engagement, um, we have a grant, in fact, to work with organizations on helping them to adopt uh, tech enabled citizen engagement projects. Um, these are organizations committed to doing engagement, but have absolutely no idea what to do about the tech piece. So skills what, what are you very, very important, and I'll put uh, I'll put a link in the chat. To Innovate US, yeah. So what would you say are some of the key learnings from that about overcoming barriers to successful implementation of these tools in policy, policy design? Is it is it hierarchical or is it just skill based at the front, uh, you know, at, at the front well, of the projects? Three things, I think. One is, a, and this comes back to the comments I made earlier about the legacy of citizen distrust. Most people who are in leadership positions are still from a time in which I think the dominant narrative, the dominant narrative we pushed in the academy. Uh, I would argue, has been one of distrust of citizen competence. So the notion that we should go out and ask people or that we can go out and ask people, I don't have to tell you, Anita, that, and I, I have to ask you, um, you know, I think the mm -hmm. whole idea of open innovation, of course, even though this idea was proposed a long time ago and um, it's still sort of very subversive, in terms of thinking about how managers make decisions, about how companies make decisions. I think the notion we're going to go out and ask, you know, even though Toyota did it in the 50s and asked line workers, like I still don't think the dominant paradigm is one of participatory or collaborative decision making, number one. Number two, we don't have the legal, cultural um, frameworks, habits or practices. And number three, we don't have the tools. Um, so the tools, uh, the things I showed you today, I mean, I showed you a lot of things today that have been developed like this year. Um, and some of the web-based things, again, have been around for a while, but they don't work very well. So, you know, we're just, I think we're just at the beginning of this conversation. So I'm excited about all the grad students who are here and I want to uh, see what they're working on. Well, thank you so much. Back to you, Avery. This has just been a wonderful, Beth. Uh, thank you again for being with us. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you so much for such an exciting presentation. I know we'll be thinking about it for some time to come. Uh, and thanks so much to Anita for helping to put this event together for our SRA community. Thanks to the audience for your wonderful questions and your participation. Um, we at the SRI are off for our next Wednesday seminar due to University Reading Week, but please do join us again Two weeks from now, uh, November 15th, we'll have a talk by Tawana Dillahunt, uh, Associate Professor at the University of Michigan's School of Information. Her talk is entitled Empowering Marginalized Job Seekers, Rethinking Digital Platforms for Equitable and Alternative Employment. And you can find a link to register for that event uh, in the chat or also on our website. So thanks again. Let's give a round of applause to Beth for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing many of you in two weeks time. Thank you. Thank you so much.